praise the Lord. Welcome to Sykes and First. Why don't you stand with us and let's make a joyful noise together. church praise the Lord won't you take a few minutes tell somebody you're glad to see him tell them tell them congratulations for braving the weather this morning make sure they've got a coat with them in case we need to give them one this morning church if you'd like 
Once again, we're so thankful that you came out on this cold Sunday morning to worship the Lord with us. We're glad you're here. We're also glad you're here if you're watching on the internet at home. Um, a few weeks ago, I missed because Trenton was sick, and um, I stayed home because Lindsay had to teach Sunday school, and uh, we got to watch it for the first time. I'd ever watched it on live stream, and I was really appreciative of that. So I'm thankful for that ministry. I'm thankful to Derek for setting it up, and um, it was really a blessing. So if you're at home watching, we're glad you're watching with us. As in the way of announcements, we do have um, a few. I'm going to play the role of counselor, okay? So this Tuesday, there will not be a WM's meeting. And also, there will not be a VIP lunch this Thursday. Both of those things will be postponed. Um, with the coming weather, we just figured it would be easier to postpone it than take a risk. So um, go ahead and mark those two things out of the bulletin. Also, tonight... Um, the Strands will be leaving after the afternoon service because of the coming weather. We want them to be able to get back over on the uh, west side of the state before things get too bad. So tonight we're going to just do a prayer service at 6. And uh, make sure you kind of watch your phone and watch the, I don't know if we'll be putting it out over the radio. I don't see Jerry. I don't know how we'll get that out. I don't know if we're going to use phone calls or what. But be, cl stay close to your phone just in case it does get bad. And if we are, if we do end up having prayer service, just use your best judgment. Um, make sure you don't get out if you don't feel safe because it's not worth getting hurt over. Because God is God everywhere, amen? But listen, um, on the pew registries, there's one. It's on one in the pew or the other. So if you don't mind to, to grab that, sign in, let us know you're here, and pass it on down to the other side. The pulpit committee um, will still try to meet this afternoon at 4. So if you're on that pul pulpit committee, please uh, be here at 4 o'clock. Okay, at this time, I think we're going to take up a morning tithe and offering. I think James is going to be singing. I don't see him either. Well, we might be playing something, and that's okay. <laughs> Come on down, ushers, if you don't mind. So we have yet to have a good snow this year, so make sure you, this afternoon, <laughs> make sure this afternoon you make sure your, your snow shovels are tuned up and gassed up, or make sure you're well fed, I guess, if you got enough gas to get out there and shovel snow if we have to tomorrow. Uh, let's throw some salt down if you can. Let's bless this offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather this morning in your, in your church. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless this offering we're about to partake of. Bless it that it would go to the furthering of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. worship the Lord again in song. Aren't you, aren't you thankful that your Redeemer lives? Praise the Lord. We're so thankful for the price he paid for us, and let's, let's praise him together this morning, okay? Stay. 
in on him church no matter what's going on in your life or what's going on around you he's still the lamb of god you are my strength when i am weak you are the treasure that i seek you are my all in all seeking you Precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your thought to why his name is so worthy Matthew has written this ask and it will be given to you seek you will find knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives he who seeks finds to him who knocks the door will be opened which of you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will give him a snake if you then, 
Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Hallelujah. What do you need to ask this morning? What do you have something to ask for? So many times we come before him, it's just ask, 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 gimme, gimme, gimme. But sometimes we really have a need. We read of a situation and a door may be closed. It's time to open that door. So we seek to find it, knock so it will be opened. Everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Do you have a door in your relationship that needs to be opened? Do you have a door in your lifestyle that needs to be opened? Here we have an answer. Seek it. Knock. Ask. We do it through prayer. We do it through acclamation. We do it through declaration. Because he's a God who loves us. He's our God. How many of you do have something you've been seeking for, asking for, knocking for. We'll do it again this morning in the name of Jesus. Let's sing our course of worship again, and then let's do our petition. All right, Travis, lead us again. Jesus, Lamb of God, petition this morning. We come before you, Lord, to seek, ask, knock in your name. Lord, we have needs. We are needy people. We have needs because we hurt. Some of us are hurting. Some of us experience loss this week. Some of us have struggled with discouragement. Some have struggled with family situations. To so some of us, it may have not have been a good week at all. But we come before you again in faith-believing, reaffirming our relationship with you. And you've encouraged us to come before you. Ask, seek, and knock until the door is opened. In the name of Jesus, we declare by faith doors will now be opened into our needs, into our life, into our situation, because you're the God of all care, the God of all comfort. You are worthy to receive honor and glory and praise. Hallelujah. We give it to you. And all of God's people, a shout of praise, a hand clap of praise, because God is who God is. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's an answer on the way. Amen. There's a door to be opened this week. Amen. We keep seeking, knocking, and keep at it. We don't give up, and it's there. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Be seated. Thank you. I'm going to need an extra mic. Which one should we use this morning? Good. Thank you. Well, good morning. Have you had a good Valentine's Day yesterday? Uh, that was pretty weak. We'll have to talk about it this morning. Amen. Well, anyway, you're going to be in for a very different kind of service this morning. In fact, maybe I should be so bold and tell you that you may never have another one like this. And uh, thank you for being conscious of us, needs, life, living. So as soon as church is over, we're going to head for the west and see if we can beat the storm. Thank you for being that considerate and care about us. I don't, just about everybody who walked in the door this morning said, Pastor, you better get back home real quick. So this will be the short, no, this is not going to be the shortest sermon you've ever heard, but anyway. Why do we celebrate Valentine's Day? Do you know what Valentine's Day is really all about? I mean, we know that the card companies and the jewelry stores and the florists have found a wonderful kind of a thing to build a business on. But it's even more than that. The story of Valentine's Day begins in the third century with an oppressive Roman emperor and a humble Christian martyr. The emperor was Claudius II. The Christian was Valentinus. Claudius had ordered all Romans to worship 12 gods, and he had also made it a crime punishable by death if you worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Or punishable by death anybody who associated with Christians or worshiped their God. Valentinus was dedicated to the ideals of Christ, and not even the threat of death could keep him from practicing his beliefs. So he was arrested and imprisoned. During the last weeks of Valentinus's life, a quite remarkable thing began happening. The jailer, who noted that Valentinus was a man of refinement, a man of learning, a man of wisdom, a man of love, a man of care. The jailer asked if it would be possible for him, the jailer, to bring his daughter to the cell where Valentinus was incarcerated if he would give her lessons on living and on life. Now Julia, the daughter, had been blind, been born blind since birth, was a beautiful young lady with a very quick mind. So Valentinus read her stories of Rome's history. He described the world of nature to her. He taught her mathematics and, of course, told her about Jesus Christ and about God. So she, for the first time, began to see the world through his eyes, trusted in his wisdom, found a special comfort in his quiet strength. Valentinus, she asked, does God really hear our prayers. Yes, my child. He hears everyone, he replied. Do you know what I pray for every morning and every night? I pray that I might be able to see. I want so much to see everything you've told me about. Valentina said God does what is best for us if we only continue to believe in him. Oh, Valentinus! I do believe, Julia said intensely. I do. She then knelt by the bunk in which she was sitting on, took him by the hand, and they sat quietly. She kneeling, he sitting, both praying. Suddenly, there was a brilliant light in the prison cell. Radiant, Julia screamed, Valentinus, I can see, I can see, I can see. On the eve of his death, 
Valentinus wrote a last note to Julia, urging her to continue with her learning and encouraging her to stay close to God, and he signed it, from your Valentine. Isn't that a beautiful story? His death sentence was carried out the next day, February 14th, 270 A.D. He is buried in what is now the Church of the Praxedes in Rome. Legend tells us that Julia herself planted a pink blossomed almond tree near his grave. And today, the almond tree remains the symbol of abiding love and friendship. So on the anniversary of his death, February 14th, St. Valentine's Day is the day we send messages of love and devotion that are exchanged. Valentine's Day. Now you know the rest of the story. So now you guys, next Valentine's Day, if you forgot this one, don't forget the next one because you're celebrating a Christian martyr and his death and his life. Think of that. Don't let the world steal this celebration from us. So today's verse is, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now in order to share the sermon with you this morning, I've asked my wife to come and preach it with me. We're going to do a dialogue service this morning. And uh, some of you wondered about Donna. She's here with us today. And if I can turn this thing on, honey, we will have, give you contact. Good. Got it. Now, yes. We are, <clears throat> when we begin talking about love, and what we're talking about today and all of those things that are there, it's, of course, this husband and wife thing. And, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And um, many, many times we wonder why God made us the way he made us and why we don't seem to get along as well as we should sometimes. So uh, this little thing we're going to share with you to kind of get our jump off in is uh, called How to Tell a Man from a Woman. We thought you might need this kind of information. <clears throat> so, go. Are you ready? Sure. Now let me know if you can hear me. Is it coming through okay? Okay. What is a man? A man is a creature of superlative intelligence who can understand the, Dow, the principle of the jet propulsion, the paramutual betting system, and the Dow Jones averages. But he can't figure out how to put on a baby's diaper, and he can't grasp the basic theory of the hook and eye. A man has a remarkable memory. He can recall the score of the Army-Navy football game in 1998. The electoral votes the Republicans won last election, and the gas mileage of his very first car. But he can't remember what size socks he wears, the ages of his children, or the name of that Richard Rogers number that his wife refers to as our song. And what is a woman? A woman is a rattlebrain who can't understand the Dow Jones average, cannot conquer a computer, can't follow a road map, is vague about the make and model of cars she drives, but she can recall in vivid detail the yellow organdy dress she wore to her high school banquet. She can mentally multiply 16 people by two and a half cheese canapes while she's ironing a blouse, helping one child compose a letter to Santa Claus, listening to another child practice scales on the piano. A man has astounding manual dexterity. He can untangle a hopelessly snarled fishing line. He can repair an electric plug, fix a carburetor, operate a saw, and park a 17-foot car in a 16-foot parking space. <laughs> and a woman can't do anything like that. But she can hang up a bath towel so the monogram is right side out and precisely centered. She can unjam a stuck zipper, she can remove a sliver and balance a plate of food on her lap. A man is decisive. 
He can make instantaneous decisions about mergers and advertising campaigns, cutbacks in production and million dollar bond issues. But he has to appeal to his wife to help him decide which shirt to wear with his blue suit and what to send his mother for her birthday. Me? Oh. You're not done yet, honey. Okay. The man is stoical about thunderstorms and rattlesnakes and spiders. He is fearless about guns and one-engine planes, and he gives his eye teeth to be an astronaut. He has tremendous physical stamina and thinks it's great fun to spend all day in a cold duck blind. A woman is a timorous creature who lies awake hearing strange noises after watching a television news bulletin that a psychopathic killer has escaped from a prison 1,500 miles away. But she doesn't quail in terror from a new baby, and when she doesn't feel well, she does a very courageous thing. She goes to see her doctor. A man has quick reflexes and keenly developed eyesight and hearing. He can keep track of the ball in a football game. He can hear the drop of a dime over the blare of the TV. But he can't hear a baby crying in the middle of the night, and he can't use the cell phone if a child is banging two hot lids together in the next room. <laughs> A man has great presence of mind in a crisis. He keeps his head when passing a truck at seven miles an hour. He has a calm, philosophic attitude about permanents that turn out frizzy, and ovens that go on the blink two hours before a dinner party. But he becomes a bundle of nerves during spring cleaning and is inconsolable when his golf game goes sour. Men are practical, hard-headed realists. Quite unlike women, who are notoriously childlike when it comes to anything concerning money. With paper, pencil, and patient logic, and gals, you've got to agree with me on this one. A man can prove the folly of transferring a savings account from one bank to another in order to get a set of steak knives. <laughs> Absolutely free. But a man has implicit faith in hot market tips, and he can use the same paper and pencil to prove that buying a new car is cheaper in the long run than getting two new tires for the old one. <laughs> all in all, a man is absolutely indispensable. He is brilliant, resourceful, brave, strong, steady, and a rock to lean upon. But it is his utter helplessness that's his greatest asset because it gives his wife that little flutter brain who can't open a jar of pickles the certain knowledge that she is indispensable, and he couldn't get along without her. As indeed he couldn't. Come to think of it, this isn't such a bad state of affairs after all. How to tell a man from a woman. <laughs> and we're not done yet. Now we're going to share with you some wisdom on living in a home from the smartest, wealthiest man who ever lived, who after writing down all of these wonderful proverbs, promptly oh, disobeyed all of them and made a mess of the last part of his life. But anyway, at the beginning, he had great wisdom. Well, anyway, we're going to share with you, and this little thing is called love, honor, and <laughs> question mark. This is dedicated to the many couples who do love, honor, and obey their warm-hearted impulses one to another, thus managing to live happily ever after, generally speaking. The scripture quotations are taken from the RSV version, all from Proverbs, and we'll share some of the references with you if you want to look them up later when you get home. How did the writer of Proverbs know our family so well, we asked. Aghast, we read, a foolish woman is noisy, Proverbs 9. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, Proverbs 15. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a contentious woman are alike, Proverbs 27. So how can a contentious woman and a hot-tempered man live happily ever after? It happens. Episodes of bent fenders, overdrawn bank accounts, hasty words, and just plain boredom are universal. He who keeps his mouth 
and his tongue keeps himself out of a lot of trouble. Proverbs 21. A husband at his wife's family reunion brings agony even to the most callous. Who said, your people shall be my people? Family reunions are remarkably synonymous the world over. All that weight you've put on makes you look distinguished and successful somehow. <laughs> the children must look like your side of the family. Was your father big boned or something? Don't be bashful. We're a real kissing family. I wonder how long you have to be in this family before they let you sleep in a bed overnight. I'm glad my wife doesn't feel this out of place with my family. Or <laughs> does she? Hmm. Dear Lord, the first day of my wife's reunion is over. Explain to me, Lord. Give me understanding, God. Why do I feel so inept? I'm king at work, yet I cower before cousins. Tiny aunts and uncles tower over me. Amen. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Proverbs 17. How can they say it's a man's world? Pop is hemmed in by women drivers, and a house full of kids with terminal cases of gimme. Hey, Pop, give me a dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars, a check. Hey, Pop, give me the keys to the car. May I borrow your comb, your tie, your credit card, your shirt? Besides, Pop is married to the world's champion, did ya? Did you fix the dryer? Did you fix the screens? Did you fix the yard? Did you fix the car? Did you fix the patio? Did you call the roof man? Did you see what I bought today on sale? Did you hear what I just said to you? And always, did you deposit your check yet? <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Dear Lord, I guess I should call you father this time. Are all the words you get gimmies and digits? Then, you know, I'm glad they need me. I just want them to know I am really trying to do my best. They're a lucky family to have me. A pop with a credit card, a comb, a check to deposit, keys to a car. Did you know that, Lord? Give me strength and give me patience. Amen. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules a spirit better than he who takes a city. Proverbs 16. I don't know what's the matter with the car. I just heard a clicking noise, and it started stopping. The man says I threw a rod, and I didn't throw anything. You can't come get me? It wasn't my fault. I just had bad luck. What do you mean I am bad luck? <laughs> do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it. Proverbs 3. He likes the evening paper folded neatly when he comes home. Oh, that doesn't matter. He shouldn't be so demanding. She always wants me to call her if I'm late. Ah, that doesn't matter. She's too demanding. Estrangement begins with the first, that doesn't matter. If it matters to my spouse, it must matter to me. The glory of young men is their strength, but the beauty of old men is their gray hair. <laughs> There's quite a few of you here that have beautiful yeah. Those, those that still have hair. Okay. <laughs> hey, see my baby girl I shouted in the hospital the day she was born, such a short time ago. This is my baby girl, I said to the wedding photographer at the church as he took pictures of the bride yesterday. Who gives this bride away, I heard the minister ask just now. Not I. I don't give her away. She's just leaving on her own accord. Unthinkable. What man is going to give away his baby girl? On second thought, young man, I do give you a girl who can spend money wildly on eyelash curlers, bathing suits, boots, Ugg boots, weekend trips, jeans and phone calls home, and cell phones. I do give you a girl who seldom washed a dish, wielded a mop, or cleaned a closet, unless coaxed 
or worse, threatened. I do give you a girl who loses glasses and car keys and door keys and wallets and library books and shoes and clothes and occasionally she loses her temper. Dear Lord, I pray, give her young man patience, a strong will, a clear head, and the ability to make enough money to replace all that she loses. Because you see, my wife is very much like that. He who forgives an offense seeks love. The argument started over a mere trifle. I've forgotten what it was now. I remember we were told as newlyweds, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Well, the sun went down and we slept with our wrath. The sun is up and we have gone to work sullen and power. I'm here wishing I'd said, I'm sorry. Maybe he'll call me on his office break. Maybe I'd better call him. There are some good-looking secretaries in that office. <laughs> Dear Lord, I am sorry now. I wasn't sorry last night, but I could have said, forgive me. This is going to be a long day. I'll bake his favorite pot. No! I remember that's what we argued about. My meringue on pies. He has his nerve. Now, I'm not sorry anymore. <laughs> I can't get accustomed to spending holidays over at her mother's. All the noise and racket is just too much. They all laugh so loud and fuss so loud and all of those kids running around. It was always so quiet and restful at our house. Sometimes maybe grandma would come on over, but that was really all. After dinner, dad and I would go hunting. Mama always made hot biscuits in the morning. She always brought hot coffee to wake us up. My clothes were always washed and folded and put away. Mama even ironed the sheets. I just can't imagine Dad hanging out clothes on a clothesline or taking the garbage out. I grew up in a big family. Christmas and Thanksgiving were noisy and fun. Lots of family and lots of food. All my sister's kids came. They'd plan a concert and we'd pay a penny to get in the living room to hear it. Dad always took out the garbage for Mom every night. He'd get in the kitchen and help her chop celery or just put his arms around her while she was drying the dishes. Getting a meal at my house was always a family enterprise, complete with everybody flipping everybody with wet dish towels and sitting at the tops of their voices. He thinks we're crazy. <laughs> Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I tell you. You think this is all fiction and made up. It's, uh... one, time, one time, somebody put on a tape recorder at uh, our Christmas celebration. And they tried to figure out, and it was just, just let it run. It was just one great <laughs> noise. But we heard Mama Hofferman over everybody else's voice. You think Donna's got a trumpet in her voice? You should have heard her mother. I'd say, Mom, just. Yell out the door, I can hear you. You don't have to talk on the phone. Oh well. Go on, we're going to get in trouble here yet. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Proverbs 25. I'm sure one reason married couples are not blind to their faults is because of a gentle and sometimes not so gentle reproving. Couples with honesty enough to straighten each other out with love should boast a listening ear. Don't talk so loud when you get excited. You monopolize the conversation at lunch today. Nobody else could get a word in. You talk so long saying goodbye, it's forever. Stand straight. Stand straight. Be proud, my dear. <laughs> uh, oh, dear Lord, it's a prayer. It's easier to be a reprover than to have a listening ear. Help me to be a gentle reprover. Amen. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs 19. Going away for a day without a spray of the kids? Which babysitter? Her? Ugh. How do you tell the kids that mom has been so involved in work and in church and in ministry and in house cleaning and in antiques and flower arranging course that I need to remind her of me, really of us? I've been so tied up at work that all the hours we spent together recently have been leftover hours. Hurried, harried mealtimes in the early morning or the tension of the evening clamor amid the new math 
and science project crowd that has gathered around the table. Dear Lord, what God hath joined us under, don't let day to dayness put it asunder. Amen. Better is a dinner of herbs, spinach, where love is than a fatted ox, T-bone steak, and hatred with it, Proverbs 15. Dear Lord, help us to laugh during mealtimes. Give us those few fleeting minutes for frivolity together. Please give us some T-bone steaks along with the spinach. We frolic better with an occasional T-bone. We promise the love and the fun. Our kids tell us such funny things when we take time to listen. Amen. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Let her affection fill you at all times with delight. Be infatuated always with her love. Proverbs 5. Now, there are many reasons why we worship together week by week and side by side. For one thing, our prayers are almost the same most of the time. The children are away now. We pray, bless and protect them. We pray, we thank you for our health. Give us a good rest of our lives together. While she prays, please make him drive more carefully. I'll pray, please help me keep my temper while she tells me where to park, when to stop, how to avoid oncoming cars. Anyway, she's the only one who ever got a ticket and a fender bender. Now see, if I weren't in church, I'd start shouting at her again. As I said, there are many reasons why we need to worship together. The usher must surely wonder why I'm so grim coming into church, the house of God each Sunday. Oh, dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord, I pray. Just don't let me ever get so infirm that she has to drive me around. Spare me. She doesn't know a thing about driving. Amen. A word in season, how good it is, Proverbs 15. Now some of you are poking each other a little too much out there. In season means at the right time, at the right time, say. It's good to have you home again. Um, you really smell yummy. New perfume? You're a good mother to our kids. Wow. You're some look, good looking gal for an older lady. <laughs> At the right time, say, I'm proud of you. Thanks for the laughs. You're fun. Even if you can't balance a checkbook. Always, every day, and on every occasion, it is the season to say, it's the right time for him to say to her, for her to say to him, it's good to have you here. A word in season, how sweet it is. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. Proverbs 17. Dear Lord, they brought the grandchildren over today. That fat little baby boy crawled up in my lap and fell asleep listening to my pocket watch, my collector watch. What satisfaction. Mama made gingerbread cakes and tied warm knit caps under soft pink cheeks. We blew noses. We found lost shoes. We settled I got it first disagreements. They've gone now, and we're so thankful they came and went. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion, Proverbs 18. A man or woman doesn't dash into work shouting, hey, hooray, my article was printed, or, it was, or my department just went over the top. We have to pretend it was nothing. With our colleagues at home, we not only should be able to shout our success, but to express our defeats without fear of rejection or judgment. At home, we receive the strength and composure to try again. It is beautiful to hear our spouse say, I never believed in myself as much as you believed in me. Drowsiness will clothe the man with rags, Proverbs 23. He who is slack in his work is a bother to him who destroys, a brother to him who destroys, Proverbs 18. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you. Proverbs 6. Dear Lord, keep us an industrious family. Honest labor day by day is a gift from God. 
May we teach our children to see each worthy task through completion to know the joy of real accomplishment. Do we skip that next one? Maybe better not. A foolish woman is noisy. Proverbs 9. Oh, okay, okay, honey, I'll just skip that one. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. The Proverbs heart, 18. The heart of her husband trusts in her. Proverbs 31. He trusts me in the big things, such as loyalty and honor and discretion. It's those little things, such as the car, accurate messages, and the checkbook that he seems to lack confidence in my ability. Dear Lord, opposites attract, they say. We compliment each other, they say. It's certain we seldom compliment each other for our dissimilarities. We're not mismatched. We're just made differently. Male and female, we were created. His chief virtue becomes my worst fault. Her minor obsession becomes our next major conflict. Remind us, Lord, that true love, mature love, is able to distinguish between the important and the unimportant differences between us. Amen. How can two people remain married when they're so different? She never forgets birthdays, anniversaries, or phone messages. He never remembers. He never forgets to record a check, though, pay the paper boy, or keep income tax files. She never remembers. He never likes to tarry at the door prolonging the goodbyes. She always does. She never considers that cars run on gas, or that dashboard warning lights mean something, that a no parking sign means no parking. He must consider these things since I don't. Do you promise to love on our end? Change the baby? No more charge accounts? Take out the garbage? Not touch my tools and don't use my razor? Go to mother's tonight? Explain these blank check stubs. Do you promise to love, honor, and? Pick up your clothes. Mow the grass. Pour the water. Hurry up or we'll be late. Turn off the lights. Don't shout. Come home early. Take your medicine. Don't eat so much. <laughs> Do you promise to love, honor, and? Obey your warm-hearted impulses one to another. Success comes in marriage when you actually prefer to buy the washing machine instead of a new set of golf clubs or that new gun. At least you tell her so. Success in marriage comes when you cheerfully cook breakfast for him without even mentioning that you've been up all night with sick kids. It means yard work, baby diapers, medical bills, kids in college, counter kitchens full of pots and pans, mothers-in-law, and ecstasy. Human relationships should be an expansion in the family. Dependency, trust, responsiveness, confidence, and ecstasy. Achievement of these elusive goals does not occur spontaneously when two people fall in love. Only as years pass can a family growing in love boast success. Even then, only with guarded caution should it be said, we have a happy marriage. Outsiders seldom know the times that pride was sacrificed. Outsiders never know the prayers uttered for patience and persistence. Outsiders don't need to know anything except that success in marriage is seldom easily attained. If we can remember that husbands and wives do think differently, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to communicate these differences to each other. Then, a fitting epitaph for each of our marriages could be, they lived happily ever after. Generally speaking. Wisdom from the wisest man who ever lived. Thank you, honey. Now we celebrate our... We celebrate our anniversary, June 28th, 1957. We've been married forever. And we're going to fight this one out to the bitter end. <laughs> God's been good to us. We've worked at it. It's been great. Love can take many, many kind of forms. But when we take a moment and we look at love, love is both a positive and a negative. 
1 Corinthians is the definitive description of love. When we look at it, there are seven positives and there are seven negatives about love found in this short chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails. Love never fails. Verse 13, and now these three remain. Faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. Chapter 14, verse 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. But follow the way of love. Love does not just happen. Love is worked. Do any of you know who Mendelssohn, the great composer, was? Do you remember that name? Love affairs are not unusual when we begin looking at them, past, present, and future. Moses Mendelssohn was the grandfather of the well-known German composer Felix Mendelssohn. Now Moses Mendelssohn was not handsome. He happened to be a grotesque hunchback, bent way over. One day he visited a merchant in Hamburg, Germany, who had a beautiful daughter called Frumpty. Interesting name. Moses took one look at her and fell hopelessly in love with her. But Frumpty was rep repulsed by his misshapen appearance. When it came time for him to leave, Moses gathered his courage and climbed the stairs to her room to take one last opportunity to speak with her. She was a vision, beautiful, a heavenly beauty. After several attempts, at conversation, Moses asked her shyly, do you believe that marriages are made in heaven? Yes, she replied, looking at the floor, and do you? Yes, I do, he replied. You see, in heaven, at the birth of each boy, the Lord also announces the girl he will marry. When I was born, my future bride was pointed out to me. Then the Lord added, but your wife, will be humpbacked, grotesque looking. Right then I called out and said, Lord, a humpbacked woman would be a tragedy. Please, Lord, give me the hump and let her be beautiful. When Frumpty looked in his eyes, she was stirred by some deep memory. She reached out and gave Moses Mendelssohn her hand and later became his devoted wife. Love. Love. Think of it. Bennett Cerf related a story about a bus that was dumping, bumping along a back road in the south. In one seat sat a little old man, wispy, little, gray-haired, sat holding a bunch of fresh flowers. And across the aisle was a young girl whose eyes came back again, and then she looked away and came back again and looked at the man's flowers. The time came for the older man to get off. Impulsively, he thrust the flowers into the girl's lap. He said, I can see you love the flowers, he explained. And I think my wife would like for you to have them. I'll tell her I gave them to you. The girl accepted the flowers, said thank you, 
and then watched as the elderly gentleman got off the bus and walked through the gate, empty-handed, of a small cemetery. Love. 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 Think of that. Love. Love affairs are not unusual among teenagers. It's not particularly surprising when such love affairs are broken for some reason or another. Normally, teens get over the hurt they feel for a broken relationship and discover that there are other fish in the sea. This very typical pattern of teenage love began as Philippe Garça Jr. began doing things with Donna Ashlock. Now, Philippe was 15, Donna was 14. They didn't date, but they were together. It's puppy love kind of thing. The date, they dated a little bit until Donna cooled the romance and began looking at other boys and dating other boys. One day, Donna doubled over in intense pain. Doctors discovered that she was dying of a degenerative heart disease and desperately needed a heart transplant. Philippe heard about Donna's condition and told his mother, I'm going to die, and I'm going to give my heart to Donna. Now boys, young boys, teenage boys, with all that testosterone and irrationality, irrational things from time to time, they say that, and after all, appeared he appeared, Philippe, perfectly in good health to his mother. Three weeks later, Philippe woke up, complained of pain in the left side of his head. He began losing his breath, couldn't walk. He was taken to a hospital where it was discovered that a blood vessel in his brain had burst and left him brain dead. Philippe's sudden death mystified the doctors. He remained on a respirator while his family decided to let the doctors remove his heart for a transplant for Donna, his kidneys and eyes for others who were in need of organs. So Donna received Philippe's heart. After the transplant, Donna's father told her that Philippe had evidently been sick for a number of months before he died. He said, Father, to Donna. He donated his kidneys and eyes, and there was a pause, and Donna said, and I have his heart. Her father said yes. That was what he and his parents wished. Her expression changed just a little bit. She then asked her father, who knew? He told her, everybody. Nothing else was said. A few days later, a funeral procession seemed to roll on forever through the orchards and fields of Patterson, California. The procession was so long it might have been for that of a prince, but it was for Philippe. His only claim to fame was his love and his heart. Love. The greatest of these is love. Choose the higher way. Choose the way that God says is the best way to live. And this thing of relationships with one another, if it doesn't have love, it doesn't matter what else happens. The beautiful, classic little MG Roadster moved briskly through the afternoon traffic. The driver enjoyed the quick response of the small, high-powered, beautifully restored convertible. After driving her SUV, this little red car was rather like taking off her boots and putting on running shoes. Driving with the wind in her hair, she tried to look casual and at ease, but inside she was a bit tense because she didn't often drive this car, her husband's pride and joy. She saw only a blur of color out of the corner of her eye, before she could consciously consider her actions, she swerved to miss the small boy on the bicycle and veered into the side of a large gray pickup truck. The car stopped with a sickening kerthunk, and for a second there was just the tinkle of falling glass, and then all was very still for what seemed like an eternity. Hey, lady. Some strong arms lifted her from the vehicle and helped her to the curb. Are you okay? 
Uh, she said, yeah, I'm fine, but just let me sit here for a moment or two. And all she could think was, I'm fine now, but Jim's going to kill me when I get home. As she waited for the police to arrive, she recalled how excited he had been when he found the car. He'd wanted one like it ever since he was a young man. The, this one was a rare treasure. He had restored it. He had spent hours, Saturdays, polishing it, fixing it. He knew every bolt and spot of chrome. It wasn't really his wrath she feared, but it was actually the fact that he was a gentle and a loving husband. But she dreaded the hurt and anguish she could see in his face when he heard the news. That for her would be worse than if he would get angry and yell at her. Thank God I'm not hurt, she thought, but I sure am worried about telling Jim. Her head was bent down on the curb, and she saw the highly polished boots stop at her feet. May I see your driver's license and your insurance papers, miss? The highway patrolman said, and the officer felt sorry for her. He thought, what a great little car that was. <laughs> She walked to the car, got her purse, grabbed the insurance packet from the glove compartment, gave the officer her license, opened the plastic package that contained the insurance papers. To her surprise, there on top of all the documents was a white envelope with her name on it. She opened it and began to read, Dear Beth, if you are reading this, you have probably been in an accident. Don't worry. I pray that you're all right, and just remember, it's you that I love, not the car. Jim, love, makes preparations. Heavenly Father, this morning, we've all been challenged by this thing called love. We know what it is when it's not around. And we know what it is, when it is around, when it marks our life together. So I pray, Lord, this morning for every person that is here, that we choose the way of love, that we choose the path of love. The greatest of these, all wonderful faith, hope, but love is the greatest. If we're gonna make a mark on this world, if we're going to lead our families, it has to be because of love. Teach us to love more fully as you would have us treat one another. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not hold grudges. Love forgives. And on and on we can go. And I pray, Lord, that within every one of us, this is the greatest fruit of the Spirit to be manifested in a human heart, is this thing called love. In your name, may this church and this body of believers become known as the church where love can be found. People where love can be found. And Lord, help us to be the church and the people that emulate you who are the greatest example of love the world has ever seen. You gave your life for this church. In your name, help us to live every day with that in mind. Amen. I am debating in my mind whether we should do the next thing. If you don't want to stay for this next session, you are free to leave at any time. How many of you that are married couples would like the opportunity to renew your marriage vows? Anybody here this morning? Have you ever done it? Do you need to do it? Would you stand with me? Now, if this is too painful, all of the couples, everybody just stand. And that'll make it easier. All of us just stand. And if you, if this might be too painful for you, if you're singled, whatever, how you've been singled, or you just 
this will be a little embarrassing, you're free to leave, but the couples who would like to renew their vows. I am a preacher. I have a black book. I will marry. <laughs> I have married. One of the greatest joys of being a pastor. So for you that would like to, we didn't announce this ahead of time, or if you want to stay and just be a spectator, you can do that too. I would invite all of the couples to take your spouse by the hand, or maybe your spouse is not here, but someplace else in the building. If you want to run and get him or her, that's okay. We'll wait a little bit. This should only take us about 10 minutes. And, well, unless, you know, we got to really get serious. And all of you that are couples, come on down to the front. And all the rest of you can stay or leave. You do whatever you want to. Next Sunday, we're going to do this all over again. Well, not the vow renewal thing, but we're going to celebrate church next week. So I see some of you are dragging your spouse by the hand. That's good. Come right on down and let's stand as couples right here. Okay. We'll give you just a minute or two. And uh, God bless. Wonderful. This is going to be a moment of time. And I debated whether we should do this but I voted for it, argued with myself whether we should or shouldn't. Some of you might really need this this morning. Hmm. Donna, where'd you go? Oh, you're right behind me. I'm sorry. <laughs> we do this together. And it does us very good to be reminded. And on an anniversary, on a special date, on a special time, yeah, we need to do that. Now, if your spouse is not here and you've got a cell phone and you want to repeat those vows, get them on the phone, get her on the phone, and join in. That's right. Amy's over here doing it. David better be free for the next few minutes. The wedding ceremony probably began with an address to the guests, and it went something like this. We are gathered in the sight of God and in the presence of this company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. In creation, Adam, the man, was formed, then the woman. The scripture tells us that. So that the woman might be for the man, setting forth in humility, modesty, gentleness that should characterize her kind. Yet man, in being made last of all of God's creation, was set forth as the best and most excellent of all of God's creative works. He created the male and female. Eve's being made after Adam, and out of him sets an honor upon the woman as being the glory of the man. In being created from man or out of man, she was not out of his head to dominate or be over him, out of his feet to be under him or trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, from under his arm to be protected by him, and near to his heart to be loved. To you gentlemen that are here, Will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? To live together after God's holy ordinance and the holy estate of matrimony. Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health and forsaking all others, keep you only under her so long as you both shall live? And to your ladies, will you have this man to be your wedded husband? to live together after God's holy ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony, will you love him, honor, keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep you only unto him so long as you both shall live? I do. Then, gentlemen, take your wife by the right hand. There. Hold her hand in yours, and you may look at her. Repeat after me. I take you to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I pledge you my trust. Now, ladies, it's your turn. Make sure that, that you have your man's hand in yours. 
I take you. I take you to be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better for worse. For better for worse. For richer for poor. For richer for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and cherish. To love and cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge you my trust. And thereto I pledge you my trust. Let's meditate for a moment on the symbolism of a ring. Likely rings were exchanged. The Bible tells us that when God made a covenant with Noah, he set a bowl in the cloud as a token of a covenant. He said, I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant. From this we learn it's well for us when we enter into a solemn agreement to set aside a reminder. You have selected rings to be a token of marriage covenant. A ring is made of gold, a type of metal that which will not tarnish, most enduringly, fittingly represents the ties that bind husband and wife together. The ring is an endless circle until broken by some outside force is a symbol of the unbroken union which is to continue until broken by death. Both of you repeat it together, husband and wife. With this ring, with this ring I do wed you I do wed you with all my worldly goods. With all my worldly goods. I endow you. I endow you. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. The Son. The Son. And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. Then the preacher maybe did a charge. Now let me speak to your hearts. I charge you both as you hope for happiness in your married life to be true to the vows you have made to each other with your marriage from this day. You begin life anew with larger responsibilities. And now, having heard you make these pledges of your affection, take these vows of fidelity, I do by the authority conferred upon me by the Church of Jesus Christ and by the laws of the state of Missouri, the Commonwealth, pronounce you husband and wife, no longer two, but now one in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you may kiss the bride to seal the promise. Honey, I love you. Those whom God has put together, that no man or anything, including mother in laws, put you asunder. <laughs> Thank you. You didn't know this had happened coming to church on a Sunday morning, did you? God's got some good surprises. Strong homes build strong churches. Strong homes build communities that last and societies that make a difference. We have a tremendous responsibility to model before this world what marriage is really about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for each of these families this morning who have taken a moment to renew and help us to remember the vows that we said sometime in the past. And Lord, I pray that you would be the unseen guest in every phase of these homes. Strengthen them. Help them. In the struggle of life, may we not forget the big picture, what we're really all about, what you have ordained in creating a home, the foundation of life, of society, of churches, of families, begins with a home. And we rededicate ourselves to being the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Wonderful. Thank you for being patient. And if anybody here has a marriage license, I'm ready. We can do it again. (laughs) Oh, here we go.